Hello and welcome to another Market Muse content strategy webinar in our content strategy webinar series. I'm Jeff Coyle, the co-founder and chief strategy officer for Market Muse. Um, and today's discussion is really, really exciting. It's how, to, how and why to craft more inclusive content and marketing campaigns year round. Um, and I love that it says year round, we're gonna get into that. Um, and my guest is one of the most awesome people on this subject, but before I do get into that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, ask us anything, uh, you know, if it's related to our discussion and we can address it in line, um, we may get to it just in the natural course of our conversation. Um, if there's anything that, you know, kind of doesn't fit, we'll save some time at the end and answer them in that rapid fire motion. Um, when you get, you're going to get this replay in the next couple of days. Um, when you do, uh, certainly download it, share it, um, but also go to the marketmuse.com site and go check out our webinar archive. We've got hundreds of them in there uh, from amazing folks on artificial intelligence like Chris Penn, uh, Paul Reitzer, who runs the Marketing Artificial Intelligence Institute. Um, and, you know, we've got topics of all kinds, uh, you know, sales enablement with Pam Didner, keyword research last uh, two weeks ago with Dmitry Dragolev. Uh, so you got anything you possibly want, we probably have a webinar on it. So go check that out. Um, all right, well, those are my housekeeping notes. I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, kind of the Director of Growth Marketing uh, from Q Digital, Ian Helms. Thanks for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about your role at Q Digital and kind of how you got into that role. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, so I'm Director of Growth Marketing at Q Digital, Q Digital like you said. Um, my pronouns are he, him, or they, them interchangeably. Um, and for those with any visual access needs, I'm a white male presenting person with a semi wavy brown hair. That's a little longer on the top and shorter on the sides. Um, my dog, a tan 20 pound Chihuahua mix named Chip is currently lounging in the background and may, may or may not make an appearance uh, or stir as we talk. Um, and I'd also like to start today by celebrating International Pronouns Day and inviting any attendees to share their pronouns in the chat or um, when you're asking a Q&A to include your pronouns so we can respond uh, more accurately. Um, but yes, to get, to, to get back to your question, Jeff, um, I, I was previously in a role as a director of content marketing at a company called W Promote, which was a performance marketing agency, um, got really into um, our, our employee resource group sort of ecosystem created an LGBTQ plus employee resource group there, started speaking on inclusion, uh, and then was discovered along the way by, by my now boss and the CEO of Q Digital um, while I was tweeting about uh, inclusive marketing on, on Twitter, of course. And, uh, and then that combined with my passion for SEO, content marketing, and just my holistic marketing and PR background um, made a great fit for what's now essentially a dream role of mine to combine all of my passions for um, LGBTQ plus advocacy uh, um, and, and help us build our baseline traffic uh, through things like organic, uh, organic search efforts and then um, expanding that into all of our other channels, email, social, what have you uh, as well. So, um, that's the that's the long and short of it. <laughs> no, it's always wonderful when someone says they have their dream role. I mean, it's it's, it's really awesome. And please follow. We'll we'll get to our social stuff uh, a little bit later. But it's it, it definitely uh, awesome awesome uh, tweet Twitter. We were talking about some of your tweets uh, from this week, and we'll probably get to a few of them a yes. little bit later. Um, but a little bit uh, just to get into the first kind of thing that I wanted to ask about is. A lot of our uh, uh, people that listen are in small to medium, maybe as as large as small enterprise or traditional companies that when if they haven't even considered diversity and inclusion um, as part of their business, you know, but maybe they want to. If they're listening to this uh, webinar, they probably are or at least it's piqued their interest at some level. How do you make that a priority um, and and what benefits would be? easy to position to a business that maybe hasn't prioritized this. Yeah, yeah. I think the the smallest, but one of potentially the most uncomfortable, but also most impactful steps is to simply start the conversation. Um, I know that it's, especially like you said, in a smaller company or in a more traditional industry, talking about diversity and inclusion can be a really difficult or um, un 
like taboo in a sense topic to to go over and so just having the the conversation bringing it up um is a is a major step in the right direction and one that can get get the juices flowing hopefully with leadership um and and i think to uh the biggest selling point which i know we have a slide for is that there's just uh, a ton of value that comes to, comes with being more inclusive in your marketing campaigns or just even in the um you know the the overall company like internally as well um buying power of diverse communities is huge this slide is based on 2020 us census data um and you can see that uh different diverse communities have tons of buying power uh, added all together hispanic black lgbtq plus asian and people with disabilities have um over 40 percent of total us buying power if you factor in women i think that ends up at doubling the number of buying power as well too um and so the more inclusive you can be in in representation and making sure that um, people feel like they're welcome to shop at and be a part of your brand and your company and your services and your products um, the more likely you're going to be able to attract those dollars and and get those people into your uh, into your fold in an authentic way that then gets them talking about your business to their friends and therefore sort of does some of the marketing uh, work for you as well too. If, if, if the way that your business manifests maybe online or in kind of real life space um, is driven by your marketing team or your content team, um, you, know, ha, ha, you know, a lot of times you'll have a, a wing of the business has some diversity, but as uh, you know, the marketing team, the stuff that's gonna manifest online, even product marketing, um, how do you prioritize that within the company and say, hey, this is our content team, this is our marketing team, it's probably going to represent how we manifest into the world. You know, is that is that something that's separate or is it is it combined as an effort? Yeah, I mean, it sort of goes back to hiring processes, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need the best way to have inclusive messaging to make sure that you're thinking about things in an inclusive way um, to communicate to these communities in a, in a more authentic way as well is to have people on your team that are a part of those communities as, as much as possible. It's not always possible um, to have every single demographic necessarily represented, but um, it's something like 20% of the US population is Hispanic. Do you have you know two out of 10, one out of five, I guess that's the lowest uh, number, one out of five people at your company, are they Hispanic or, or not? Like, if not, mm -hmm. can you can you get closer to that so that you have, um, you know, those those more unique and accurate depictions of the world around you internally, as well, um, and and then that will sort of naturally, hopefully, manifest into other conversations, into other opportunities, um, and so on and so forth. It's like the fact that most CEOs and most C level folks are are white men. Like that's that's not. Um, that's not great when we're talking about being inclusive and making sure that communities are represented and making sure that um, people feel comfortable to have a seat at the table because um, it the that um, sense of belonging and that sense of inclusion comes from the top in many cases and so um, to put the burden solely on the people that you're hiring also isn't isn't um, going to be successful necessarily it, it needs to be very much like a, a lived and breathed part of uh, your entire company. And, and having that accountability is also a really important factor that people should be able to feel comfortable, uh, again, having those more difficult conversations around uh, inclu inclusion and diversity as well. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned, you know, starting the conversation and then, you know, the, the teams that are representing how the business is going to be represented, not just the number of employees have you know, the, 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 the need for consideration on these things. Uh, you know, what, how do you, how do you make this not be a short-term thing, like a small campaign or a thing we did to check off the box, which is terribly, unfortunately, so common, um, and, uh, and make it 
kind of a, a, a mid to long term, you know, initiative that you know everybody's always thinking about. You know, because that's that's really the thing that I, you know, frequently, unfortunately, judge uh, when I'm looking at businesses, and and I see is this an always on thing or was this a uh, a flavor of the month? Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. Um, it, I think the biggest problem that can come up is that folks approach diversity and inclusion efforts, especially in marketing campaigns as the, as what you said, the flavor of the month. June is pride month. So let's make sure we have a rainbow logo. February is black history month. So let's make sure that we highlight some of our, our black employees like October, September through October is Hispanic heritage month. Let's, let's focus on some Latinx change makers. It's not like, it's great to have representation and to talk about those things when they're especially relevant. But if you're not thinking about how those people are making contributions year round, like the title of this uh, right. webinar are, uh, says, um, you're you're not going to be, you know, coming off in an authentic way. Um, and and I'm obviously, uh, as I described myself earlier, a white cisgender male presenting person as well so mm -hmm. i definitely don't um don't and can't speak for every single minority group and even the diverse all of the alphabet soup that is the lgbtq plus umbrella as well um but thinking from more of the queer perspective that i bring coming in with things like gender neutral pronouns in your copy both um in your blog posts and your emails not assuming, uh, not making the mistake of assuming that every couple that shops your products, if you're an e-com uh, or D 2 C retailer, is in a heterosexual relationship, using things like partner instead of girlfriend or boyfriend during Valentine's Day. Um, things like, uh, yeah, making sure that when you're going into creative photo shoots um, and and getting these images from places that are hopefully not just based on sock imagery that you're that you're making these um conscious efforts on a daily basis to uh, again to pick the world that you see around you not the not the world that you're familiar with necessarily yeah i think that you know something i think you, you think of the stock photos was a comment you made um but also you know are when you do persona analysis as a marketing team are all of those personas of one you know, of one race or of one yeah. gender, you know, even getting into it, it, does that represent that you maybe have a mismatch in your perspective? Right, right, exactly. And and to one, another diverse community on here is like based on age. There's a lot of ageism in the world. There's um, people who forget that that's like a huge market as well, too. And when you're talking about um, B2B SaaS companies that are disruptors and they're making huge changes in technology and they assume that all of the people that are reading their content are, you know, fresh out of college, young folks or whatever. Um, and that, that they, they forget that the internet's been around for, for years <laughs> and years and that lots of other people have significant backgrounds and experience and, um, you know, the way things were before they got to where they are. And, and, you know, you, you can forget that when you're talking to those communities or, um, when you're putting together a campaign and assuming that people do or don't know what they do or don't know, um, when that might not actually be realistic. No, I, I think that's a great point. And yes, the internet has been around for a while. There's enough of us. And if you, if you unfortunately or fortunately follow SEO Twitter, you'd know that ageism is a daily yes. uh, like <laughs> pie that, that, we, that everyone deals with um, in that world. But that's another topic for another day. Yes. Um, the, uh, <laughs> SC, if we talk about SEO Twitter, we will be <laughs> off in the that, that is a we'll rabbit hole that we do not want in to the go land. <laughs> um, So um, uh, one thing I would say, though, is when, when you look at someone who's doing this well, right, um, what types of businesses pull this off authentically now? And, uh, you know, e examples, sure, but like, do you see, do you see a typical business who is almost always at the forefront? And then maybe you know exceptions in the middle um and, and then you know kind of ones that just don't even broach yeah yeah i mean i think it has a lot to do with i i'm trying to think about like the best way to answer this i think it has mm -hmm. a lot to do with 
the communities that naturally belong or flock to certain services and products. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about this previously, but um, beauty brands do a really great job with diversity and inclusion. Um, clothing brands, especially D 2 C clothing brands, do do really mm -hmm. well. I think places that are more internet native have always been a lot more um, inclusive in their practices. Um, I there's a, a jewelry brand called Atomic Gold that I love out of that's based out of New York. They're trans owned um, and they have size inclusive, gender neutral um, jewelry because they haven't been able to find that previously. And so it's mm -hmm. people that are coming up and sort of solving these problems, especially to even in like the tech space um, that that don't see themselves represented or don't have the access to the products or solutions or services that they need that are then um, being really great examples of how to do inclusive marketing right. Um, companies like I think Sprout Social is a great one when you're looking mm -hmm. at diversity and inclusion. They have very clear policies on their site. They write about it all the time. They publish about accessibility, um, have that visual rep representation in their imagery. The people that are that are posting on their blog um, and the headshots that you see aren't um, are diverse as well too. And so you, without, I think going back to the last question too, without sort of being blatantly um, obvious and doing like a pride campaign for the sake of pride, right. you can see it's sort of unspoken. You just see these things and it, and it feels right. And it feels um, authentic without them having to say, hi, we, we value diversity and inclusion. And, um, and here's some examples that we're highlighting because we feel the need to highlight it. It's just doing it without making a show of it. And that makes it even more, um, more real in that sense. I think that that's, I mean, I think that the tip of, of the day for anyone is I, I've heard it stated as you, meaning the person listening to it, you don't have to notice it. Um, you know, you don't have to notice it for it to be valuable um, exactly. and for it to illustrate authenticity. It's not, I mean, like you described before, using uh, appropriate pronouns within the language, um, you know, Valentine's Day was a great example, you know, speaking about partner, um, you know, if someone isn't keyed in, you, you may read that and not even notice it. Exactly. And, but there, there's, there's amazing amount of value to that because that's what authenticity is. It's just that becomes part of you in the way that you speak. I mean, I'll give you an example of, of, of my experience here is I did a, um, a, a research effort with Content Marketing Institute. It was about words that one shouldn't say, right? And mine was SEO content because I think it debases uh, um, SEOs and says that they're lower than content. But a, a one that I read was um, North Star don't use North Star because you're basically alienating the entire Southern Hemisphere. And I said, oh my goodness. So another <laughs> thing that I, I got, I, I was like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm alienating the entire North Star because I say that all the time. And yeah. so another thing about this, I think is everyone in the business needs to be okay having maybe been wrong in the past, right? I mean, does that get into it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. I've gotten this wrong before. I'm, like yeah. I said, I'm one piece of, the colorful fabric that makes up the community and I certainly haven't said or done always the the right the fully you know most inclusive thing in the past just because sometimes it's resource limitations sometimes it's um, knowledge limitations but as long I think the the key that you're sort of getting at is as long as you're you're learning and growing acknowledging those mistakes um, making a con conscious effort to not repeat them obviously mm -hmm. um those are things that are are going to go a long way um mm -hmm. and and you might think that they're silly i think that's that's one of the biggest arguments that i always have with uh not just in my work life but with family <laughs> and friends as well is they're like oh god now we can't say north star or whatever like <laughs> like oh the those people in the southern hemisphere are so are so sensitive or <laughs> whatever um right. like not accurate necessarily in the sense of like it's a little bit uh, like extreme to to say that everybody in the southern hemisphere would be offended by that but right. the more yeah yeah but the but the more inclusive that you can be the the more um just like the the more beneficial that is i one of another anecdote that i can share is i'm i'm plant-based i eat 
essentially a vegan diet. And the issue that I have when I go to restaurants is that vegetarian is not vegan, right? But mm-hmm. vegan is vegetarian. It's like a, it's like squares and rectangles. Like some mm-hmm. all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. If you can achieve the square, anybody will be able to 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 be a part of that conversation mm-hmm. community effort that you're that, you, that you're engaging um and the more that you sort of go out of that the the less inclusive that you are being and the, the more issues that you're going to ultimately run into when it comes to being called out for making mistakes um or or just sort of ignoring communities altogether which is i think it's worse to not try and to ignore communities than it is to try and make a mistake and then you know make up make up for it later i think that's words of wisdom and you know getting getting into that i mean i think that speaks to um maturity model of your business with respect to diversity and inclusion and you spoke about kind of start the conversation is one thing so that maybe maybe that's step one um what are the things that and you also mentioned that you led a employee resource group if someone is not aware of what an employee resource group what is that and then what after that what are the things that you look to um to implement or like milestones um that would illustrate one is on the path yeah yeah um internally and externally um yeah i would say more yeah. internally is what i'm okay. what i'm referencing but yeah externally is is also a uh, um you know a, whether that involves surveying whether that involves you know other yeah. types of focus yeah. yeah yeah they sort of go hand in hand as well too so um yeah, starting an employee resource group was something that I've done at a few companies that I've worked at now. Um, thankfully, at Q Digital, we're LGBTQ owned and operated, and basically, being an employee here is just being a part of a of a diverse um, group of of folks that are like me. So I haven't had this. We don't really have the need to start an LGBTQ employee resource group here, but um, it, it's essentially a group of folks who identify as a particular identity, whether it's LGBTQ plus or black or Hispanic or Asian, um, sort of getting together and creating a, 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 a place, a safe space for people to have conversations and talk about, um, you know, what they're feeling. And that might be from an, an equity perspective. It might be from um, just current events that are happening in the world. It might just be mm-hmm. from holidays, like I, like I kicked off today with International Pronouns Day. Um, and just bringing more awareness to that because y- people don't know what they don't know. And, and having those employee resource groups are really empowering to allowing the employees who um, want to advocate for themselves to, to have a, an opportunity to do that. Um, and I was careful about my choice of saying, like, want to. It's not it's not a burden that everybody wants to take on it and, it and it is a burden essentially um for lack of better words to to start an employee resource group i didn't get paid extra to have right. to do any of the employee resource groups that i i led um it was essentially volunteer time on top of my normal 40 hour day to day i still had really awesome panels and events and communications on a monthly and quarterly basis that i that i ran um, in some cases, I was able to get budget for for opportunities for um, events and swag or whatever else you might want to have associated with those. But it wasn't always easy, and it wasn't always readily freely available. Um, but but having those employee resource groups when there is an interest for it and there is somebody who's willing to take on that that burden is really is really helpful. It's helped. At previous companies attract new talent retain talent um get the conversation going about inclusive language we were talking about um that a little bit ago one of our one of the former clients of mine um in a previous role was uh, a women's sorry it, it they they previously branded themselves as like a, a surrogacy they were a service surrogacy uh service and mm-hmm all of their emails were about women and she and her and um, and using very fe- female only pronouns and language. Um, and by having conversations through our employee resource group, the account manager on that team approached their marketing team, their counterparts at the company to say, hey, like, 
not everybody who has female reproductive parts identifies as as she her or as a female like could we make this language and our communications not be gender based and they were super receptive to that but if it wasn't for the event that we had where we talked about pronouns and we talked about why inclusive language matters um they likely wouldn't have thought about that anytime soon and it would have never been a change that had been made um and now it's been a really exciting and um you know successful part of of their inclusive sort of journey into um maturity um i think to to elaborate a little bit more after employee resource groups a big benefit of those as well is to use them as sounding boards for policies mm -hmm. so um we worked a lot with our HR team to talk about um, our insurance policies as inclusive as possible and um, trainings. We had a, a bias training that um, used he, him, or they, or she, her, he, or her, like all the time throughout the, the, the training. And we're like, why does this have to, There, it's so much more cumbersome for them to record this and say um, he or her than to just use they instead. Um, and there were some some other pieces that we had called out that our HR team then escalated to the training service that we were using that then got them to update their videos to make them more um, more inclusive as well. And so consulting consulting those folks who are there who again want to because you don't want to just tokenize or or have somebody like call them out for their diverse perspectives if they're not necessarily. Um, wanting to be the face of, of their community because that's not, it's a lot to, it's a lot of pressure to, to have. And there's probably things that I'm saying even here today that I'll, that other people might disagree with who are um, a part of the LGBT human, LGBTQ community or otherwise. Um, but again, that's part of why this conversation I think is important and why, um, why, why I'm happy to be here today. <laughs> no, it's, it's amazing. It, it, it illustrates that, you know, certainly, you know, have to be, have to have humility in this and, and, and recognize that, you know, it, you know, what we look at even today, even five years from now may change what the, on the forefront of, of doing this in a way that's, that's appropriate for, um, you know, for an inclusive, I mean, that yeah. can change. And if you, if you look at maybe someone who, uh, led this initiative five years ago at a, at a business, um, their things, their, their, even a, a top maturity, uh, team possibly would be, you know, considered only in the middle of the group right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of, I think there's lots of resources out there that folks aren't aware of because there's an, you need to want to, do this to mm -hmm. to be able to do it successfully and there are people there are consultants there are plenty of organizations that offer free resources as well for um mm -hmm. how to do and communicate well and, and most effectively um the human re uh, human rights campaign has a corporate equality index that they release every year that ranks uh companies on a scale of one zero to one hundred in terms of how inclusive that they are with their um, LGBTQ plus related policies and workplace environment. Um, and the goal isn't the goal. The ultimate goal is to get a hundred, but by going through the process of, of trying to meet all of the criteria and get to a hundred, it helps you identify what you're not doing, um, as well as possible. And, and again, it's okay not to have everything right and in place immediately, but, um, you won't know what you don't have in place until you actually try to get there right so from a from a content perspective a lot of the people on our on our uh, group obviously content strategy content marketing um from a content perspective what is it a checks and balances process it, let's say you don't have um that type of inherent diversity in your the sourcing of content or your outsourcing um location it's just maybe not possible for the way that you outsource your to your to a writing network uh, do you, is, is the process to, you know, have that as part of your creative brief or your content brief? Is it a check and balance after you've received drafting? Is it part of the developmental edit? What, what are the things that have worked? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's being, you're, you're spot on. It's being cognizant of it from starting 
out to to the final product like if you're not thinking about it from the beginning it's like uh to use your taboo word seo content if you're creating seo content or sometimes people create content and they're like hey can we inject some seo into this and i'm like it's too late at the end usually like we can't just shoehorn some keywords in all the time and and make that post suddenly rank on page one because it wasn't created in the beginning with seo in mind and that's an issue the same the same applies for inclusion and, and diversity if, if you're writing on a topic that has inherent overlap with diverse topics or um that gets into um some of like the diverse communities that we talked about and you don't have somebody on your team that represents that it's important to then do the work to do the research to find out what does this like what are the nuances in the language that might need to be used or not um what are the keywords that might vary here versus um versus what we might assume that that we could use and you'll be surprised often what you might find as you start digging um i worked with a pharma company once and we we were working on some some campaigns for them um and their their target market for the particular campaign was 65 plus folks I'm certainly not a 65 plus individual, um, but but by going through and doing some research on what competitors were doing and just like immersing myself in the content that was out there that was communicating to these communities, I was learning like the difference between elderly and geriatric and 65 plus and older and what the nuances for each of those words necessarily meant and whether or not those words were targeting individuals versus like doctors versus um, just other people that are working in the space. Um, and we were able to then uh, use that to craft a better content brief so that the writer um, knew what language to use or not. And then also on the flip side, sort of to your point that when we were editing it and it went to our editors that they were also aware um, and could see that in the content brief as well and help add that extra check and balance as well. Yeah, I, I think I read I read in a, a study, I, I don't know the source, so I have to look it up afterwards, but, you know, um, the average individual above 65 does not like the use of the word senior. Right. I mean, and then, and, and, and so different types like that. And, and I mean, my parents, yeah, they don't like to be called senior. Um, no. And I know that because and they're, and they're over 75. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that. And, and I, and, and, you know, how does that manifest in your, in your messaging? And so what, with the content team, um, you know, I think it's, Similar to the, by the way, when you said SEO content, your dog shifted. He knew. <laughs> he, he, knew felt that, it, uh, he felt the evil. He, he felt that he was like, no, 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 we're not doing a diversity <laughs> audit on every page. So, I mean, I guess don't do your, you know, so there, you know, the answer isn't to do a diversity audit to on every page. It's certainly to think about it earlier on, but like, I guess maybe that's a, a minimum that would be a diversity or inclusion yeah. audit so that people are at least are learning from that developmental edit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Google has some really great resources on their all in um, page. It's called Google All In. It's their essentially inclusivity uh, hub. Um, mm -hmm. It starts, I think, the four points, and we've covered a lot of these already, is it starts with your team, making sure that everybody on your team is as diverse and inclusive as possible. But if they're not, making sure that they're well read and, and in on a lot of the that they're thinking about things in the right way, um, going into their into their day to day work um, to incorporate this into their strategies on a regular basis to make it a daily practice, essentially, and not just an afterthought like we're talking about now. Um, then the next step would be creative and copy and making sure that all of that's very much um, as diverse as possible. And then um, the accountability piece that we already talked about a lot, too, I think that's one where it can again be really uncomfortable to call something out. Um, we've had some conversations here at Q Digital about whether or not to include the plus sign on LGBTQ, the acronym, um, and like that's very much the plus is always like and any other community underneath the queer umbrella. Um, it's implied nowadays, which is like kind of the argument. Like when you say LGBTQ, it essentially impl uh, implies and everybody else, but of course, mm -hmm. historically, the everybody else wasn't always fairly represented. I think even in like Europe, they still use LGB 
and don't always include the T, which is not, you know, they're excluding the trans community in those conversations. And that's like, not okay, right. And so having that plus, I think is still, you know, it's controversial, even within our community, right. And and I think that there's um, fairness to both perspectives when it comes to why or why not you might want to include the, the plus or not, but um, having those conversations and being uncomfortable and, and, and hearing each other out um, is, is a big, is a big piece of it. Yeah. I think, you know, thinking about the, like you mentioned, that's more like a, is it a catch all catch all appropriate? You know, you look at other cultures and um, even languages, you know, in, in Latin languages with masculine and feminine, um, yeah. you know, you get into a, a great deal of, you know, location specific, even language specific, um, uh, has to go into um, your content strategy, and in, uh, in you know, I've, I've listened to a number of really amazing translocation um, and, and translation companies who, um, you know, a, a big differentiator for them is that they're not just translating; they're translating and making sure that they're not uh, yielding to bias. Have you encountered yeah. that with anything yeah. with translation or location? Uh, um, well, fun, fun facts that one of my, my majors in college was Spanish. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of how the different dialects vary relatively familiar, I guess, at least without actually like, yeah. being a native probably speaker pretty good, yeah. yeah. Um, right. but, but yeah, no, I was traveling around South America when I was, uh, a few years back. There's, it's not like, this isn't uh, as extreme of, it, of an example, but the word for strawberry varies on the northern part of South America versus the southern part of South America. And so if you use one word versus the other, there's not always a guarantee that somebody's going to understand what you mean or that right. they're going to know um, what the, the nuance behind it necessarily is. Um, and the same goes for, for yeah, other, other language and topics when you're talking about um, certain words that you choose to use or not, whether or not they're slang words um that are acceptable or not um and it's not always a one size fits all again which is the difficult part and that's what scares a lot of people i think from um translation services or or expanding internationally because they're like oh like is this perfect and again like going back to one of our other topics of conversation earlier it doesn't always have to be perfect but as long as you fix it or if you're called out for it that you acknowledge it and do something about it um, and then move on. Like that's the that's the that's what's most important. So I think uh, you you touched on this. Uh, I think it was probably now 10, 15 minutes ago about um, it potentially being impossible to do things for everyone all the time. And how do you balance the de- maybe the desire to you know do that? It's kind of like a because um, aren't it, it, it doesn't it a challenge to prioritize a group because it isn't that being kind of like throwing in the in the uh, against the concept of inclusion. So I, I, I find that to be something that, you know, I commonly think about it's, it's that, well, am I, how, how do I prioritize one group? Right. Yeah. And how do I, how do I address that? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that there's a right, a right answer at right. all. Um, I think doing again, something is better than doing nothing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so whether you start with one group that's more impactful to or like more not impactful but more close to home i guess for for you um that's like one step in the right direction and then you can sort of create that foundation and that process and get the the wheels turning and then expand from there um would be an opportunity again if you're a smaller business and you're like i don't i don't know where to start like should we start with pride should we start with black history month like do you have LGBTQ plus employees, like, would that be a great spot to start? Do you have black employees that might want to be seen and represented throughout the year and be a part of the conversation? Um, starting with that and then, and then, yeah, naturally expanding as time and resources allow, um, because then you'll have that foundation. You'll hopefully, you know, one year be able to cover one topic and then the next year be able to cover the next topic, which obviously isn't ideal and it's could be seen as, you know, excluding certain um, folks or other groups. But I think the fact that you're doing something is is proof that you're not excluding folks, you know, Um, and could be argued that way as well. So um, 
I, I don't know if that like fully answers your question. No, it but... does. I think, I, I, think, I think it really does. It, it just shows that, you know, anyone can get started on this. And I think that that's to the, uh, to the point. And it's to say, you know, the, you're, you're taking steps in the right direction, or at least the, the direction you think is right. 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 And you're not doing yeah. it in a way that's inauthentic. Um, and speaking about inauthentic or, or things that one might want to watch out for, or, um, you know, things not to drive the bus, not to be as your mission of this, you know, how, how would you approach a team maybe that in the past has not, has maybe done something that was more of a, of a one-time initiative and it didn't, uh, it didn't go as well. How would you go about saying what we meant to do it? But how do you get, how do you fix that? How do you get that into a better place? Yeah. I mean, I think it starts with what your goal is for your campaign. Right. Are you doing this simply to check a box? Are you doing this simply for some, PR and notoriety and to, to sort of have people be like, wow, you're so great because you celebrated this particular awareness month mm -hmm. and that's awesome. You're probably not going to get the reaction that you want the same way that you would by mm -hmm. um, taking those smaller steps that we we're even talking about and just including it as like a general, um, you know, guide for everything that you're doing. Um, that'll, that usually translates a little bit more successfully. Um, I think to ignoring communities altogether is right. an issue. Um, if uh, there was, it wasn't any client of mine, thankfully, it was a brand that I was aware of, made aware of on um, Twitter, but they were called out, for example, of not, they're a beauty brand. Um, so again, beauty brands are usually pretty great, uh, but right. not every beauty brand is created equally, right? Um, they only their whole Instagram feed, if you scroll down, was all white women, all white cisgender women with long hair. <laughs> and so, so I was like, okay, this is literally one depiction of what a woman looks like. This is one depiction of what your customer looks like. Um, if like, then they got called out for it. And then every one out of five posts, then they would maybe post a black woman. Uh, but again, they, they didn't go any farther than that. They didn't have any gender diversity they didn't have any like n atypical i guess like you know whatever their depiction of what an, a woman looked like in their imagery and ads and that's really bad you know you're you're not you're ignoring people you're sort of not acknowledging that that there is diversity in the world and that's extremely inauthentic in that sense um i think too watering down messaging is an issue that a lot of People have if you're too scared of of saying the right thing you can sometimes then not say anything at all or not say the right right thing or avoid saying anything um and that becomes a problem again because you're sort of um not taking a stand and i think like especially now that we're talking about we're almost in 2023 like brand stands especially even following um the black the black lives matter resurgence after the george floyd incident like it's proven that you essentially as a brand need to to have a perspective on on issues and on things that impact your communities and if you don't it's you're again excluding people and i've had former clients as well too that have um not sent emails about pride campaigns for example to certain distribution lists in certain states because those states are typically anti-lgbtq plus and that sent a message back to me that like, hey, this is not an authentic campaign. If you're not going to make, if you're not going to put, have this conversation with everybody um, because you want to make somebody who is homophobic or racist or whatever else feel comfortable, that's not, you're, you're perpetuating the problem that we're trying to solve here. And so um, like, cool that you sort of went halfway in, but if you don't go all the way, um, that's sending a, a a bad message as well um and then to i think going toward like only engaging the communities during awareness months mm -hmm. is is both good and bad obviously because you're you're only acknowledging them for the for the moment that they exist there's um a, a really popular meme that comes up every pride month where um june 1st companies are painting rainbow logos on everything and and rainbowifying all of their products and then july 1st everybody it just gets whitewashed over and it's like they the the campaign and the rainbows and 
the LGBTQ community and the importance of them never <laughs> essentially existed because suddenly July 1st, it's no longer relevant or important to, to acknowledge. Um, and so it's like a very, like, it's like a light switch that happens um, from June, June 30th. Is that how many days are in June? Um, to July 1st. Um, and, and we see that, you know, like it's, it's very noticeable. Um, and related to that, it's capitalizing, like doing it to capitalize only. If you're not, if you're having these campaigns just to make money off of these communities, that's mm -hmm. not authentic either. Like, yes, we want to shop and we have lots of spending power, as you mentioned earlier, but no, we don't want to only be marketed to solely for the sake of, you know, you getting your hand in our pockets. It's, it's about having a, a conversation, establishing that relationship. And I think um, that's something that we haven't really fully dug into, but goes into the year round piece. Like if you establish a relationship or create um, a community around these communities or, or with these communities, that's where the work is sort of going to pay off long term and transcend just those awareness months and allow people to do some of the marketing for you through word of mouth by saying like, wow, I really love this company because they are size inclusive, age inclusive, gender inclusive, um, race inclusive, LGBTQ plus inclusive. Like they're, they're a company that I am happy and proud to shop at and I will sing it to the rooftops. And I do that with companies that I love and, and shop at. Um, and, and I think there's something really powerful in that. And again, the people that don't, I think you said it well, not everybody needs to notice it, but the people that matter, that the people that do notice are the ones that um, that it should matter for. And we are smaller percents of your audience, of course, mm -hmm. by nature, by by the just demographic makeup of the world. But um, but again, the buying power alone speaks to like why it's important to engage, engage in, and get get that conversation and relationship started with with us and. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> no, that's great. I know. I, I think it really does bring up the fact that, you know, the more you think about this, the more you notice it, the more you can kind of put your own perspective on whether something's authentic or not. And I think that that's a great place to, to pin that. Uh, the Another thing that when it comes to content and it comes to, you know, 2022, uh, you're talking about, you know, a lot of outputs of software, right? You're talking about different ways that software produces text, right? Whether it's yeah. generation or whether it's uh, information retrieval driven. So uh, a, a website's internal search or a web search engine. Um, how has how has your kind of perspective changed on that? And I mean, for me, one example here would be, you know, if you're using text that's coming from an outsourcer that you've never worked with um, and you're not checking it for these types of biases, it's you know, similar to and generated content. If you're just publishing that, um, you know certainly that's a, a nightmare for me. I'm, I'm guessing a nightmare for you. But but like, wh what are the other ways that you know not just you know making sure you, you scan it to make sure that it's not horrible, but what are the other things that you see in the, in the market that have um, made you think it can't just come out of a computer or an artificial intelligence thing and then be uh, manifest as being your brand message? Yeah, yeah. Um... That's a great question. I uh, one example that comes to mind that also is part of this conversation is there's a lot of bias inherently that go into technology and software is based on the people who are creating them, right? And um, Google was called out recently for some of the algorithms that were favoring um, white people in the search results versus um, BIPOC communities as well. Like um, the prominent example that comes to mind is when you searched um, professional hairstyles up until like, mm -hmm. I think it was like a year or two ago, honestly, that they fixed it finally. Um, all of the professional quote unquote <laughs> hairstyles were depicted on, on white cisgender people. There was no, um, there was no diversity in the hairstyles and it was all very much like the same, the same images, the same content that was being written about it. Um, mm -hmm. And if you search unprofessional hairstyles, it was black hairstyles. It was um, hairstyles for people who were gender nonconforming that were showing up. And that's obviously 
not what unprofessional hair is, but through the the tools and through the perpetuation of like what's on this page one of the search engine results pages, how should we position this? Oh, it looks like everybody's writing about these hairstyles as professional and these ones as unprofessional. And so then the people who write the content or the keyword research tools that you're using to find them or the outlines that you're creating are going to have those biases that came from the other biases that came from the biases of the tools. Um, and it sort of creates this really negative snowball um, and, and gets you into a position where you're, again, perpetuating the, the issue instead of being a part of the solution. And that's where you need to sometimes balance whether or not it's it's valuable or not for you to be a part of the conversation in the way that the tool like Google might want you to be a part of the conversation versus how you think or know the conversation should be. Um, and Google, again, has since fixed this. They got called out for it and fixed it. And, and the results are much more diverse now. It's still obviously some inherent biases and things that happen because professional things very much did come from the straight, cis, white, male-dominated world <laughs> to begin with. And so um, I think there's a lot of unlearning and, and relearning that needs to happen in, in all sides there. Um, but even too, I think this goes to the to the tweet that I shared yesterday that that we um, that we talked about with um, you know keyword research tools don't always get it right. If you're using um, I, the reference that I made was for Semrush that I did a search for um, the keyword queer and I was looking for some topics around that and it also included queen in the t in the results. Like that's obviously not like a, a negative thing necessarily but they're they're two different topics they're two different terms they're semi-related in some context if you're talking about drag queens or how people refer to themselves in the community but certainly not queen elizabeth <laughs> um or certainly not um dairy queen or things like that um that were also turning up in the search results and so um i i've had to apply extra filters to find the things that i was looking for to to narrow into those topics and um as great as the tools are at sometimes like presenting related topics or questions or keywords that you might want to explore. Um, they're not perfect either. And so again, it goes into like being conscious of that and knowing to dive a little deeper. And if you don't know that you wouldn't know to, or, or you might limit yourselves to the surface level piece um, and not, and not make your content or, um, campaigns as as inclusive as possible as a result there's there's some market muse regulars probably listening to this webinar going oh okay now i know why jeff asked that question i mean <laughs> it basically the, the perils of copying your competitors right yes the perils the perils of copying your competitors is you might be copying their bias um and also you know what is a synonym what is a synonym is not always what is semantically related and that's what you describe it's you were almost like they were almost including queen in a re re rewriting of your query, like saying right. it was somewhat right. of a synonym um, when it really could be semantically related in one uh, one particular meaning of the word. Right. 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 And right. And yeah. 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 And the other one was if you search LGBT, it doesn't expand into LGBTQ, LGBTQIA, LGBTQIA 2S. Right. It doesn't go into the full gamut of the, alphabet soup that makes up the LGBTQ umbrella. Um, and that, and there are actually, at least according to Semrush's data, mm -hmm. significant dis like differences sometimes between somebody searching LGBT history month versus LGBTQ history month. And so knowing, knowing that and understanding like where those overlaps are or aren't um, can be helpful as well too, obviously in the way that you're structuring your content or the keywords that you're incorporating or even the rabbit holes that you go down and further research by, based on what Google shows, because it's not, again, always perfect. Um, and right. and there's lots of examples of that, but um, not enough time to cover them all. <laughs> yes, not enough time. <laughs> Let, yeah, let's just say, if you if you look at the words that are bolded, oftentimes you can see if your queries are being rewritten or if additional terms are being added. Um, so always be cognizant of that when you're analyzing search results and, you know, dragging it back to, you know, content strategy and content marketing. And, uh, you know, I think that that's very valuable advice is to make sure that if you're 
you know, just as you would uh, make sure that intent is explicit um, and make sure you're covering all intents, covering all uh, possible target markets and covering all uh, communities is, is as important um, uh, to me, uh, to, to you and, and to, to, yeah. to take on these initiatives. And what, yeah. how would you, how would you go about, you know, expanding on that? And then also, you know, thinking about, gosh, the flip side is, is if you do identify something that isn't, uh, certainly you're tweeting about it because it's, you know, your role and your, and what you do, yeah. but you know, how do you, how do you get through that internally to say, Hey, this is not what we're going to do. This is, this is, this is against what we're going to do. Yeah. Sharing it, having the conversation again, using mm-hmm. Slack channels or email or mm-hmm. whatever communication works best for you and, and your team to make that be a part of the process, incorporating it into any training that you might have or any style guides for your writers, I think is also um, an important piece and um, something that you made me think of as well uh, off of what you were saying is if you're looking at the SERP and you're trying to uncover what Google is looking for for a particular topic or a type of content that you're creating, um, the rule is always sort of potentially emulate that, but then do do it better, expand upon it, do more. Right. Um, and one of the ways that you can do better or do more is by thinking about it in an inclusive way and incorporating you know, imagery that's better representative if it's a particular topic that it lends itself to it or language that's more inclusive or, um, you know, copy that, that combats the bias that's in the other um, posts. And so um, having that, if you're outsourcing your content, especially to when it, if it goes to somebody who's not a native English speaker, like being explicit about that or on the editorial side, on the flip, like when it comes back, um, you know, knowing that and being cognizant of it when you're, um, you know, scrubbing the content for accuracy and inclusivity and just making that, a, again, a part of your, your daily practice is, is ultimately going to, going to help you get there and avoid any of those issues. Um, 57 minutes, that's the mic drop moment. So we're going to spin into the offer. Um, by the way, what I'm trying to say is if you want to make things better, making it more inclusive and uh, approachable from all communities is a way to do that. Um, And guess what? It works. Um, And so um, if you want to look at your content uh, through the lens of any level of expertise, uh, uh, check out a demo, book demo on Market Muse. Um, Ian can be found, as he's mentioned a number of times, on Twitter at Ian Helms, uh, LinkedIn. Um, He is, again, the Director of Growth Marketing for Q Digital uh, and I am Jeffrey underscore Coyle on Twitter, uh, Jeff Coyle on LinkedIn, and Ian, tell us, uh, you know, sign us off, give us your your sage wisdom, uh, what's your what's your takeaway, and I'll give you the last word. Josh, um, yeah, if the the only way that you can start to be uh, as inclusive as possible is to start trying. Um, so so if you have any questions or are looking for resources, definitely reach out to to me or get in touch with hopefully the market muse team and they can connect you with me as well too if you want um but but yeah you can't you can't make the world a better place if you don't start to try to make the world a better place right you gotta um create the world that you want to to see and um the only way you can do that is by by taking the sometimes uncomfortable first step um but but once you take that step it gets easier and easier from there um so yeah, I'll leave it at awesome. that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and thanks, everybody. And uh, we will see you next time on the Market Views Content Strategy Webinar Series. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. Yeah.